Welcome to your Race Industry Now show brought to you by EPAR Trade and Racer. I'm Racer Magazine reporter Marshall Pruitt. You're not here to see me, though. You're here to hear from our guests. We have Sebastian Bourdais, Colton Herta. We also have a mighty fine person by the name of Dave First. You probably know him over the many, many years of the great content that Davey did in Indiana, in Indianapolis, television, TV's Dave First. He's now IndyCar <laughs> VP of Communication, Dave First. Davey, wanted to get you on the show here. Do some previewing, talking about what's coming with the 105th Indy 500. But really, I hope let's start with what we've had so far. You would know better than most looking at the metrics, looking at the requests for interviews. What are some of the biggest stories you've received at the Speedway over the past week over practice and qualifying? What are folks wanting to know about? What do they want to talk about? Yeah, it's it's still, right, the Super Bowl of the NTT IndyCar Series, right? The uh, Indianapolis 500 presented by Gamebridge Charter, I believe, 105 years. I just remember the 100th year. Uh, the <laughs> 100, you know, it wasn't that long ago. Now we're all at 105 and, as the track, of course, celebrates 110 years now, which, you know, you and I were both here around for the 100th year anniversary. But anyway, time passes. Uh, the storylines continue. And it's interesting. I, the storyline that everybody keeps going back to is this youth movement that we're seeing in the NTT IndyCar series. And, you know, in the first couple of races, we, I, I thought it was just kind of a nice subplot. And, you know, we would see the Dixons and the older guys. Uh, and I'm going to call Joseph Newgarden an older guy. Oh, Grandpa. Grandpa Newgarden. Grandpa, or even Rossi. But uh, there's a lot to this. And I know you've done the numbers on this. And after the uh, GMR Grand Prix, uh, I did a couple of numbers on this. I mean, the average age of the first five winners of the NTT IndyCar Series season in 2021 uh, is like 25.2, I believe. And in the history of the sport, that's as young as it's ever been. And the closest you might get is 1999 uh, in the cart year when you had some guy named Juan Pablo Montoya and some other guy named Greg Moore. They were they were 23 when they were winning races. These guys are younger than that. I mean, and take Scott Dixon out of the mix. He really skews the whole average, right? Because in the 40s, otherwise you'd really be young. So uh, there is a lot to what is happening right now. This is talent. Not only one or two two drivers, but a number of young stars that are coming up at the same time. This is generational stuff, Marshall. We've never seen anything like this. And the good news is, because they're so young, we're going to see these kids for many years to come. Second youngest front row for the Indy 500, I believe, as well. Uh, you can tell it's us. up there. Yeah, the, the true youngest was like, what, 1940 when Robin Miller was only like 70 years old, I think. Um, he was thinking about proof. qualifying for the 500, too, back then. Yeah. But further proof to your point, though, is that we're just in the middle of this revolution of youth. They're coming. They're going to own the series in due time. Yeah, but you look at Tony Kanaan, Elio Castro Neves, Paul Sitter, Scott Dixon, all 40 plus. They're not going away easily at all. Another storyline, we've had some drama, we'll get to that in a moment, about Will Power and some crazy things we would have never predicted in qualifying. But I'd love to touch on, Davey, what's been a heartwarming, overdue, thank goodness it's here type thing, and that's Peretta Autosport. 20 women on that team, some of them going over the wall, some of them on the timing stand, some of them, them handling business, marketing, promotions, you name it. This is not a token effort. This is right. real, true. Women are here. Then you add all the other women working on pit lane on the other teams more than we've ever seen. Can you share some some impact and insights that you've gotten from folks wanting to know about Beth Peretta, her team, Simona Di Silvestro, and really a year we're going to look back and say, we put a line in the sand and said, the women are coming. Yeah, and, and look, you know, women in this sport – it's well documented. This is certainly nothing new, but this sort of effort is new. Uh, even when Sarah Fisher was, was on the team, and Janet Guthrie ran her own team and so on and so forth. But uh, this is really top to bottom and that's the goal moving forward. And yes, it's going to be a co-ed group. I think uh, on race day, there will be a couple of guys jumping over the wall, uh, over the wall for Preda Autosport. Uh, but they have, I mean, they, you think about, 
uh, the NFL Combine that happens every spring and usually happens here in Indianapolis. And they, they train all these young guys to figure out who really can make it past college football and make it to the pros. Well, that's exactly what they've done with a lot of women who have signed on down in North Carolina. Hey, this interests me. I want to be a part of this. And they've been training uh, almost 24-7 to get ready just for this race. And it's not just this race, I think, when it's all said and done. Uh, Beth Peretta has uh, some great aspiration when it comes to doing other races. Uh, perhaps further on here in 2021, that's the two-seater, by the way. And I apologize, it's windy here in Indianapolis. This is as warm as it's going to be all week. We've got temperatures in the 90s. Uh, good news is temperatures should be around 70 or so, low 70s uh, for Sunday on race day. But uh, it is female Ford in every sense of the world, uh, word. And even when... Yes, yeah, she was the 33rd and final qualifier on Sunday. And Marshall, you should have heard the crowd cheer when the time expired and everyone knew that Simona de Silvestro was back at the Indianapolis 500, that Beretta Autosport was in the Indianapolis 500. It was emotional down there. Uh, some tears on the crew women uh, and crew men up and down. It, it was a very emotional scene. And uh, pretty heartwarming to see, even more heartwarming when you consider this is only the beginning for this team. I have a sneaking suspicion that in one of those two two seaters behind you is Team Penske's Will Power getting in some extra practice laps. <laughs> right? Last row, Will Power? What? Planner, I know, right? Baby. Can you walk us through talking about crowd reaction? Gasps. What? IndyCar's yeah. reigning pole master, one of the greats of all time, the team, right? I realize you're sitting in the building that RP owns, but we're not accustomed to Team Penske being a dramatic storyline in terms of are they going to get all their cars in? There's some talk about experiencing that firsthand as well because, I mean, we expect Will Power to do big things in the race. He's got a long distance to travel, though. Yeah, he does. But you know what? And I know it's a cliche, but this is a long race, right, buddy? Uh, and this you're going to go through with some seven, eight, maybe nine pit stops. So Will Power, if anybody's going to cover the back and win this race, it's, it's Will Power, right? Uh, but it was interesting to see shades of kind of what we saw a couple of decades ago when, when Team Penske missed the show entirely. I've uh, never seen a, a Penske car that far back in the, in the last row. But I'll tell you what. It was something to see when he went out there and qualified and still brushed the wall uh, on that final lap. And he thought, I mean, there was no choice. He had to stay in the gas. He had to stay in it. And when he went down the backstretch, not knowing just how much damage really that car had seen or had done in the previous couple of corners, he didn't back down. I mean, that's one of the more, I, I know the, you know, the marketing a slogan for the series is defy everything this year. And he did exactly that, staying in the gas to complete that qualifying run, not knowing what would happen in the next hour because the conditions were only going to get worse. It was hot that day. Uh, so chances were you weren't going, we're not going to go any faster uh, or whatever damage they might have in that 12 car. They did take some time to fix. And if they had to do that, then they would have to withdraw their, their, their time and their speed. So, uh, it really was amazing to see all that. And, yes, there was drama. And afterwards, I saw a couple of people you know, Roger Pinsky and uh, the, the president of Pinsky Corporation, Bud Tinker. They both came out of their trailer, and they were both wide-eyed. And they both <laughs> looked at me and they said, what do you think of that drama? That was pretty cool. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, you had a car in that drama. But it all worked out in the end. But there was no question. The drama was back, and it was good to see. Will Power on a new marketing initiative demolished everything. Thanks, Will. Leave <laughs> Almost me did. They're just fine. Uh, the the team told me as well. Uh, Marty Snyder had reported during the NBC broadcast that there was a little bit of toe out from Will hitting the wall. It wasn't a huge amount. But that's a huge amount. Uh, inches of additional toe out. And again, that's not massive. Yeah. It just means the rear of the car is trying to come around and meet the front while you're in the middle of the corner. That's not good. So power is insane. Let's cover off in two more things, Davey. Before we get to thoughts about the upcoming race weekend, some heavy hearts, but also some celebration this month as well. Whether it's losing Uncle Bobby, but seeing 
uh, those Uncle Bobby stickers on a number of cars, including our keys. We know that we're always thinking about ready campaign we know that we have bob jenkins always uplifted in our hearts and, and his ongoing recovery we're always thinking about the the future and the present when it comes to the indy 500 davy but maybe just share some thoughts about the history is a big part of what we do we're always hearing a lot of friends who've either recently passed or who are struggling right now with us yeah and there's no question about it and the thoughts for those folks uh, are with us here at the Speedway each and every day uh, because this race, this great facility, which you see behind me, uh, you know, the sport that you and I fell very much in love with, uh, it's all nothing if not for the great history uh, of this place and, and those that have driven and, uh, you know, a lot of blood, sweat and tears just to make the race. Uh, so, yeah, th it's been heartwarming to see uh, Uncle Bobby stickers uh, everywhere. Our friend Steve Shunk, who uh, does a great job of public relations for Borg Warner, he's been handing them out. Uh, it's actually funny to see you walk around all of a sudden out of nowhere. You'll see an Uncle Bobby stickers that someone put uh, <laughs> somewhere. Uh, but even Andre Ribeiro, uh, yeah. for crying out loud. And, and none of us, not a lot of people knew what was going on with Andre. We heard about his passing during qualifying weekend. And, uh, Bob Jenkins uh, battling uh, brain cancer, and there's a special event coming up uh, uh, this weekend with, with Bob and, and Robin, of course. Uh, uh, I know Robin's going to be around this weekend, so it, it, is, it is heartwarming. Uh, it also makes you really appreciate what this place is all about, and maybe also makes you really appreciate each and every moment we all have out here. And may I say, we're missing you out here as well, Marshall, and uh, we know you're going to be out here next year and for many years to come. We're thinking about you and your family as well, buddy. Thank you, brother. Yeah, Mrs. Pruitt and I are going to be there. She's going to be with me next year, so good for that. Well, let's close on one other topic of tradition. Last year's Indy 500, no fans that will never sit right in any of our hearts. More than yeah. 100,000 fans coming back for the 500 on Sunday. As a man of the people, Davey, man about town, man that everybody knows and loves, share with us what you've heard from some of those fans. Who have been on the side of the Speedway last year and listened and watched, but give us some thoughts about getting back to normalcy, getting back to having fans. This is well, I, I know you can appreciate this. Uh, throughout the course of the week, last week, you know, during breaks in the practice, they usually replay several races on the big video boards uh, and the new video boards that uh, uh, Roger has put up over the last couple of years. And invariably, you go back to highlights of the 2020 race. And we're all sitting there watching it. Oh, Sato with a big run late, and, you know, he won the race. And you look around. There's no one in the stands, and it looks like a regular practice day for quite a loud. It's, it's incredible to think that that was actually an Indianapolis 500 that happened. So flash forward to this year, and, you know, I spoke about the emotions of Beretta Autosport and Simona Di Silvestro uh, when they qualified for the race, and she climbed out of the car. And just to show it, it you never take fans for granted. If nothing else, after 2020, what we all lived through, and in many ways continue to live through, you don't take the fans for granted one bit. Not that any of us did coming into this, but certainly after that. And this cascading sound of fans uh, coming from the stands, and I think that led to the emotion, uh, maybe to a, a couple of tears here and there, and it was only exacerbated by Fast 9 qualifying, and when... VK came back in, and B, I tell you what, Rita's VK is becoming a fan favorite here at IMS, or even Tony Kanaan, who's been a fan favorite, and Carpenter uh, as well as a multi-pole winner, multi-time pole winner for the five winner. But then when Scott Dixon came out and blistered them all, and came home with his fourth pole position for the Indianapolis 500, uh, I tell you what, it, it's not going to be the 200, 300 plus thousand fans that we're used to, but it's still going to look pretty damn good. 135,000 fans uh, for the 105th running of the Indianapolis 500 presented by Gainbridge. 
we're going to take it. We're going to enjoy each and every moment of it when the green flag flies uh, just after 12:30 Eastern. And we're going to enjoy it, and we're also going to look ahead to 2022 with the rest of those fans that can't make it here this year. We hope they're all here in 2022. Davey first, you're the best. Thanks for taking some time, my friend. Thanks for getting us ready for this Sunday's race. And yeah, there might be an old fat reporter in California tearing up a little bit when uh, the uh, the old green flag starts coming out here. So thanks hey. always, Davey, and we'll speak to you soon. Yep. Back home again in Indiana. It's what it's all about, my friend. Amen. I believe on the other end of our telecommunication devices, we have my French fry, the Sebastian Bourdais, Joining us for Race Industry Now, brought to you by Epart Trade and Racer.com. I see Sebastian Bourdais. You are rocking it with the Rocket T-shirt, or T-shirt, uh, button-down shirt. I don't know. I'm drunk, but you expect that. We get to do a hamburger and french fry show. It's a tragedy and a travesty, or a tragedy, as I like to call them, because I'm here. You're the pro. I'm the idiot. But you let me ask stupid questions. And hey, you're going to help get us ready for the Indy 500, which, thankfully, you're a part of. How you doing, my brother? Yeah, we're doing all right. Uh, not, not been the easiest of weeks, but, uh, you know, it's it's Indy, and when you see two Penske cars fighting it in the bottom five, <laughs> you're kind of feeling pretty grateful that you didn't have to go back on Sunday. But, uh, yeah, I mean, qualified that uh, Chevrolet uh, Rocket number 14 for J4 Racing in 27th. So nothing to get super excited about, but uh, you know, I got, I got my brother uh, sitting 26. He's, he's just in front of me in the RV lot, and he's uh, next to me on the grid, Simon. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> some uh, you know some surprises, and uh, I guess uh, Indy's just never short of it. Well, if I'm thinking of famous number 27s, that's a number used by both Ayrton Senna and Gilles Villeneuve. So let's just say that you, knowing their greatness, said, that's the number I'm going to use to propel myself to victory in that number 14 Chevy. Okay. Am Sign I me up. at all? <laughs> no? Okay. Well, Seb, tell us about how this week has gone. Uh, you are not qualified 27th because you want to be 27th. They replayed more than once your 2017 qualifying attempt, where minus a slight detour in turn two, you probably would have been on pole. We know you can go around that place blazingly fast, but when you're not all the way there, not because you or the team isn't trying, tell folks how sometimes things don't go exactly according to plan. Uh, every year, man, it's it's always the same, right? I mean, uh, in Indy, obviously, you're only as fast as your car is. Uh, there's, there's some components of how much you're willing to trim and, and uh, how much you want to hang it out uh, for sure. But, uh, you know, first of all, the biggest story of this year is, is how tight the field is. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, I mean, the, the gaps have become so ridiculously small that, unfortunately, if you don't have the quick car of the team and, and don't put everything together as far as the trim and, and everything else, where, yeah, you, you're at risk of uh, not being guaranteed right away on, on day one. And, and we've seen it this year uh, for sure. Uh, so you look at it uh, between Scott and, and our average, there was basically a tiny little more than, uh, what, two miles an hour? Yeah, not much. Not not even, maybe? Uh, yeah, not, not even. So, you know, it's uh, it's just one of those, man. You, if, if anybody really knew exactly what was going on at the Speedway, it wouldn't be the Speedway and it wouldn't be mystical and there wouldn't be the upsets and the surprises and, mm. and how great it can be sometimes. So, yeah, I think uh, sometimes you just have to stop trying to explain it. Uh, for sure, on our side, uh, JR did a really good job with uh, with Mike. Uh, they, they just they prepared better on, uh, on Fast Friday. They had uh, a couple of trims that they felt fairly comfortable about. And... Uh, and we just didn't anticipate that it was going to be that much cooler. Um, and so we're not ready to put it in line like this and just take the chance that uh, it would not be, you know, balanced. Because the thing is, if you get in that line and you don't know what you got and you take the chance that uh, you're going to just hang it out and hope for the best, uh, well, it can it can bite you back pretty good. Um, so we didn't really want to take a huge chance. Um, 
I honestly didn't think that if we had trimmed like JR, we were going to end up kind of the low P20s. Uh, and actually, he could have done better because he got the hard limit or none of his fault uh, on lap three, which is the reason why he got that 229 in there. Uh, but overall, it was a, a mighty, uh, mighty run from him. Uh, and uh, and we're just maybe a little bit slower, but he's, he's, he was definitely more trimmed than us. So nothing, uh, nothing to say about that. Uh, we'll start five positions behind him. I think we found a little something in in race trims um, on Sunday evening there. Uh, so hopefully uh, we find all our little eggs uh, when uh, comes uh, you know the start of the race. I'm not sure we'll get much done on, on, on carb day because it seems like the weather forecast is uh, is for rain. Um, but uh, yeah, at least at least we had that decent run on on Friday on the Sunday evening and. Uh, that definitely makes me feel better because it was very, very challenging for us uh, most of the week in, uh, in traffic. My French fries going Easter egg hunting on May 30th, y'all. I can't wait for that. Let's talk a little bit, Seb, about qualifying versus race trim. We know that except for the two Ed Carpenter racing Chevys, Bowtie Brigade wasn't really there in force when it comes to time trials. But if we look at all the running and race trim before, that session you mentioned to close Sunday. I don't want to say that one brand or one engine manufacturer has an adva a big advantage over the other. It looked like we should have a more balanced race. Tell us about that, though, because I know that's a, a big question, probably one of the biggest questions we've had since qualifying from so many fans. Hey, wait a minute. Uh, how does this happen where just the two Carpenter cars are there? But then we look at some of the other sessions and you go, well, looks like a little bit of a toss up. I mean, as you know, and, and fans who are, you know, following this closely start to, to understand speeds in uh, on a regular day don't really give you a clear picture of what's going on. Um, you have to start looking at uh, how closely you can run, how that run was done, uh, where you're chasing a big pack and just manage to time it right and get a big toe but not get impeded which is usually the way you get those monster laps. Um, you know, when it comes down to Fast Friday or or qualifying, well, Fast Friday, you can still get a tow. And, and with that current package, even if you're five, four seconds, you're still getting a, a heck of a help uh, when you're trimmed out. So you really need to look at the Noto reports for qualifying performances and when you did that clearly and, and you saw it again in, in qualifying, uh, yeah, the our opposition is, is very strong uh, for sure. Uh, Ed, as usual, just produced two unbelievably quick cars. I think there are a lot of people scratching their heads trying to figure out how to do that because they just do it year after year. Uh, and, it's, and it's strange, right? Because you, you look at Penske, for example, and Simon's car in 19, uh, being absolutely dominant in qualifying and super quick and and you wouldn't think that the carpenter guys could find such a huge improvements uh, from 19 to today and that Penske would forget how to make and produce fast cars uh, but something's happened clearly uh, there is a, a massive speed difference between between the two right now and, uh, and I know for a fact that the Penske guys are scratching their heads, uh, but uh, we, we per personally, we don't spend any time trying to understand or, or uh, are in the know. So we just basically do the best we can with what we got. I think uh, J4 Racing has actually done a, a decent job. Uh, I wasn't expecting us to be very, very quick. And I think honestly, like I said before, if we had managed to just prepare a couple more steps uh, in in the trim level, we were at minus four on the rear wing, which is just about as far as you really want to go. That rear wing just doesn't do anything after that. You can go minus five, maybe minus six, but you're mostly taking up downforce and no more drag at that point. So it's more like the car attitude and what end plate positions you put on the front wing and things like that. Um, so yeah, there, there are a lot of unknowns. I feel like comparing performances right now between Honda and, and Chevrolet, which, which is our our, our side of the of the paddock uh, 
we're pretty happy. I think it's it's definitely a lot closer than last year. Is it completely balanced? If you look at qualifying, you'd say no, but there are a lot of things that come into play as well. Fans are also wanting to know, Seb, talking about passing on Sunday, if the temperatures stay cooler like they're predicted to be, be interesting compared to, say, last week when we had some packs running, when it was hot and the track temperature was up. And boy, we had some folks hanging on for dear life and going backwards and others trying to dodge them going forwards. And now again, we're having to do some predicting of things. We don't know exactly what they're going to be, but any thoughts on what you think race day might be like if the forecast kind of sort of holds? So the, there's definitely a bit of an inherent problem with the current aero package where um, when we get in a, in a line of cars, uh, unless you're really just like far better than anybody else, which there's always a couple of cars like that. But for the majority of the guys that are in the middle there who are pretty happy with their race cars um, and we're kind of one of them at the end there. Um, the problem is that car makes a very big wake and it, it carries very far behind the car. So everybody helps everybody as far as towing each other around. And you don't have to get very, very close to get that help. So when you're in a 10, 15 car lane, um, you come off the corner and you, th you think you get a run and, and you're closing, closing, and then he's just pulling away with you because he's also getting the help in front of him, which that was the main difference from the older aero packages with the bumpers and everything. You had to get closer to really get the toe. And so if the guy was five back and you were two, you were definitely getting him. Now, if you're five back and he's two, you need to be more trim than the guy in front of you to be able to pass, which in race scenario doesn't really happen a lot because most everybody ends up kind of running the same downforce. And if you have less downforce, then in the corner, you're really struggling to get to two back. So it, it is a bit of a crapshoot as far as that. So as soon as there is a little bit of a gap between two cars, now you have a chance to get that car that's kind of lagging a little bit. But you, you need kind of, you kind of need uneven spaces between the cars to create that differential. Otherwise, it's just not happening. Let's close on one or two things, Seb. So not abnormal in past Indy 500s, not last year, but before that for yourself and all the other drivers to be busy running around, flying around the country, doing media hits here and there. And in some cases, folks show up for carb day kind of worn out like hey being in the car for two hours that was actually a little bit of peace and and quiet for me tell us how that's changed in the COVID era and zoom and whatnot like we're doing now what's the the week coming out of qualifying been like for you and is it as bad in terms of time demands no i mean it's a lot less busy i mean we're just doing a lot of remote stuff uh but you still have some meetings and you still, you know, obviously like Larry's got the, the Foyt uh, vault, um, you know, uh, on Main Street. So we're having an event there for, for with him. Um, you know, you're having a few functions. There are uh, a bunch of uh, phone uh, windows. Uh, I'm doing this because obviously our relationship, this is nothing that was imposed to me, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's still busy and, and tomorrow it's community day and you kind of have to be on site with all the, uh, everything's going to be virtual, but you still kind of need to be there. And, and then there are some mass signings. And so it's a few little things that just keep you busy enough that you, you can't really go home, but um, it's all right. I mean, usually I actually go back to St. Pete and, and hit my uh, my local market, but, uh, you know, it's uh, it's fine. It's, uh, it's let's try and, and relax a little bit before carb day and, uh, kind of enjoy not traveling around the families coming on Thursday evening. So I'll be, uh, be good to see them. You're so selfish. Leaving Claire to look after the house and kids while you're playing race car. Poor day. Whatever, man. All right. Kidding aside, why don't we close? I always love your thoughts on things that you've seen throughout the event that interest you, whether it's a, a driver doing well, a young driver maybe that you're impressed by, uh, people you might have met, who knows, you're always pretty good at spotting things uh, that, that pique your interest. What have you seen so far? What can you share with any 500 fans that uh, has 
piqued your interest, Sebastian Bourdais? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely the that you know younger generation that uh, that is very willing to take a lot of chances. Uh, I mean, obviously, <laughs> it, bit, it bit Alex pretty good, but I mean, I've rarely seen anybody hang on to that thing as long as he did. Uh, that that crash had uh, had uh, had some you know already seen looks on on it uh, it just didn't it didn't lose the wheel <laughs> wow. uh, which, which was good for him because uh, that that could have been a, a bit of a disaster there but uh yeah I mean you look at VK um, you know in in the in the fast nine hanging on to that thing in turn one that kid's not scared of anything Seb. no anything. no and and you can't tell that you know it's because he hasn't hit yet because he had this uh, a crash right there in turn one so he knows he knows what it feels like uh although he told me that after that crash uh, on the opening practice day uh, uh during the open test that uh, he actually didn't feel any soreness or anything which was like <laughs> okay we must be a, a man of steel because i've never heard of anyone hitting that hard and not feeling something <laughs> uh but he, 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 the only thing was that little broken finger but uh yeah i mean it's they're they're tough. They're willing to take a lot of chances, and and they mostly get away with them. Uh, Colton, obviously, very impressive. Uh, I think as far as race running, um, I haven't seen the full picture, but I keep seeing Sato being coming back in the discussions uh, yeah. over and over again. I think he's he's feeling very very comfortable with that package. He's found something over the last few years that just kind of keeps on bringing him back that confidence and that comfort level that he needs to, to be able to be on the offense. So I, I definitely wouldn't be surprised to see him being a, a massive contender uh, when it's go time. Um, and then and then there are uh, quite a few, you know, really good race cars. Like Simon was one, uh, Dixie was one, TK was one. Um, so yeah, it might be, a, might be a big mix of those young guys taking a lot of chances and the old guard kind of uh, trying to keep things in check and, and maybe uh, waiting there for their time at the end of the race. So, uh, and, uh, and then as far as we're concerned, um, you know, starting 27, so you see, you're not going to win it right away, but uh, um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't finished my, uh, my last two. So I'd <laughs> really like to, uh, to be able to, uh, to see that checkered flag. And, and I think, you know, if we run a clean race, uh, our race car seems to be good enough to hang in there and, and make a couple of passes when, uh, when the opportunities uh, arise, so hopefully, uh, hopefully that turns into reality. That was my last question for you, Seb. We're in an era with IndyCar where it seems like at almost no point in time can anyone back off the throttle the slightest bit. Knowing where you're starting in 27th, how much caution do you apply? And I don't mean caution like you aren't trying, but we mentioned some of the younger drivers who are fearless and just attack at all times. Hell, they might hit the pace car. Uh, if they could just to send a message before the race starts but what's the mindset is it attack when possible is it feel it out as you go because again you're not going to get to first on the first lap i'm just curious how you you go in mentally with this yeah i mean if we get a, di a bit of a different read uh, and cooler temperatures and stuff on carb then maybe it would be uh they'll have to readjust but honestly like you mentioned and you know starting right there you have to seize the opportunities to to make passes but you also have to make sure that they are legit uh the the biggest and the easiest way to pass someone is when a bit like in the older days like 10 11 you know with the old car uh you kind of wait for someone to get impatient and make a mistake and capitalize on it it's i think early on it's a lot easier to do that than just be on the offense because if you if you do get that wash uh, at the wrong time and you roll off the corner just past Ipex or pretty late in the corner, man, you're just going to get swallowed up so fast. So you, you do have to, to kind of play a little bit of the, the patient game because in the long game, because it's it sure is a lot easier to lose places than make places. Well, Speaking of mistakes, I appreciate you joining me here, brother. Love you. Wish I was there. Uh, I'll be watching from afar. Uh, we'll tell folks we'll know how well the day goes for you on Sunday based on the text I send to ask how things went and whether I get a reply or not. 
So I guess I'll see how it goes during the race, but I'll, I'll get a feel for your tone based on the immediacy of a response or no response. But fair enough. Seb, love you, brother. Thanks for taking some time. And uh, hey, how about I see you and we do this next year in person? Yeah, that'd be great, man. I miss you for sure. Oh, we're getting soft. I'm going to wipe away a couple of tears. That is my French fry. I'm the big fat hamburger. This is our little portion of the hamburger and French fry show. We'll speak to you here next year. This is your race industry now brought to you by epartrade.com and racer Indy 500 preview. Is it a chat? I don't know what it is, but I do know this. We have Hurtamania 2.0, the man who is just wolfing down tacos, winning races, qualifying the middle of the front row for the Indy 500 here. Colton Herta, that beautiful, beautiful number 26 Gainbridge Honda and Dreddy Autosport. <sighs> How you doing? Have you slowed down? Good Lord, you were flying on Sunday. Yeah, it's it's been nice to have a, a little bit of a break um, and still be around Speedway. Uh, so, yeah, I've been hanging out, going over some data with the engineers, uh, just getting ready, seeing what we're going to do on car day for Friday, if we can make any adjustments to the car. Really happy with it, so I don't really want to make too many and, and end up messing it up. But, um, yeah, overall really happy with how last weekend went and really happy with how the race car is. So all around, smiley faces. Would I be safe in saying you were fishing for pole position on Sunday yeah. uh, on top of some other fishing activities you've been doing during the week, which I absolutely love? Yeah, no, qualifying went really well. Um, I guess to kind of explain that, what you just said for people, um, the the golf course ponds have largemouth bass in them. So I've been doing a little doing a little fishing let's see there's my fishing pole uh doing a little fishing uh when i have some off time uh, it's something that I, I actually found out from ryan newman that he's he's big into to fishing um especially lake and pond fishing for largemouth um and so i heard i heard from him basically that that there are largemouth in in the uh, in the pond so i had to go go find out for myself and there are indeed largemouth in there so hopefully you're drinking milk at the end of Sunday. Do you go and fish for your own dinner? I assume you've been throwing them all back. Uh, yeah, but... no. Okay. All yeah, right, I always enough. catch catch and release. Um, unless it's unless it's like saltwater fishing, sometimes I'll sometimes I'll keep keep a fish, but most of the time I'm I'm throwing them back. Um, if it's a, it's a if it's a big delicious fish, and I'm with people, I might keep it. We might eat it that night, but um, most of the time, no. So we're going to talk about some serious stuff here in a moment, but as if this mop hanging off my head isn't enough, any insights as to how this year, I think we have the most unkempt grid between you with the massive flowing hair, Hildebrand, Daly, Connor Daly is trying to get on, get in on things. Is there kind of a secret pact or is this just happening organically? I mean, I think Hildebrand's always had, or at least the last few years has always had longer hair. Um, and I think ever since I was in IndyCar, I've had long hair. So I think it's daily. That's kind of just jumping on the train here, um, which, you know, I think we're welcome to it. It's, it's a small group, but we're, but we're looking into growing. We're willing to grow. Um, so obviously I think, I think Hilda hair is leading the, uh, the forefront of it. He's got, he's probably got the best hair in IndyCar at the moment. Um, and definitely the longest. So, I think we're all trying to be like him. I think there's a future bet between you and Rossi. Because seeing Rossi with hair down to his shoulders, that might be the funniest thing <laughs> ever in the oh history my God, of the world. I couldn't even imagine it. <laughs> Let's talk about your run on Sunday, Colton. Obviously, Scott Dixon put up a number that was slightly better. But if we're just talking consistency, man, from lap one to lap four, that was amazing. Your dad coming over the radio, a little bit misty-eyed when you're done, saying, you're my hero. Tell us about that run because this I mentioned on my, my dumb little podcast last night. This is the all bravery Indy 500 front row. I cannot think of an assembly of drivers between Dixie, yourself, and VK of the we're never lifting. My dream scenario is the three of you on lap one of the race getting to turn one side by side, still three wide. Who's going to lift? Who's going to blink? None of you. You guys are insane. But tell me yes. about that run on Sunday to get there. 
Uh, yeah. I mean, obviously, I'm happy that we had the chance to to get there um, and, and to be in the Fast 9. But, um, you know, I think a big part of me is still kind of disappointed to miss it by by um, 300s, which ends up being around 55 inches over 10 miles. Um, so incredibly close in the end. It hurts to kind of lose it by that much. Um, you know, I was kind of hoping, you know, Dick, Dixie had what four poles beforehand at the speedway i was hoping he could lend one to me at least um but he didn't want to today so not a giving um, man no <laughs> yeah yeah what a poor sport that guy um but yeah obviously big congrats to him and and, and his crew for for doing that and uh, i think the biggest thing was really happy with the run but really happy with with who i'm around who yeah. i'm racing around i think you know two safe guys um inside and outside um that are that are smart and, you know, don't really put themselves in bad situations all that often. Um, but, yeah, just for the qualifying run on its own, it, it is it is tough. You know, 10 miles of, of flat-out driving, the tires go off, and, and you're basically holding on for lap three and four. Um, and, yeah, you kind of get those slides where it's like, you know you can't lift because you're going to give up the pull. But you're not sure how it's going to end up if you're going to smack the wall on the end of the on, end of the corner, or if it's going to grip up in the last second and, and you're going to be able to be there. Um, so it, it always is hair. You always go for it completely. Um, and the fast nine, cause you know, the worst you're going to start is ninth and there's no worries there. So yeah, it, it was for me a little disappointing, but in the end, like I said before, like just happy to be able to be there and have the chance to qualify for the poll. By no means a new topic. You and I have discussed this ad nauseum over the last year or two about this next generation of IndyCar leaders, yourself being, you know, the tip of that spear. Do you enjoy the fact, though, Colton, I know you don't exactly look at your rivals and attach them to an age, but you've been in this sport your entire life. You know the Canons, Elios, Dixons, the guys who've been here forever, the benchmarks. Are you able to at least enjoy the fact that you are making their lives very complicated and hanging with some folks who we know are going into hall of fames the minute they retire. No, it, yeah, it is cool. Um, it's honestly just cool to kind of be able to share the track with some of these guys. And um, the biggest thing is obviously Elio driving for um, Shank and, and with their kind of, I, I get to pick his brain a little bit because of, of the connection with him and, and Andretti through Andretti technologies. Um, so yeah, it, definitely trying to use that as much as you can i've never had a a three-time indy 500 winner on the team and i'm sure most people haven't so um yeah it's it's really cool to to have him on the team and just the way he talks about things is incredibly smart um and and he says stuff that that i wouldn't even have thought about um you know when setting up a car or how he approaches a corner or what he thinks about traffic um, and, and what the car is doing in traffic and what he thinks is causing it. Um, so he is, he is a wealth of knowledge. And then, yeah, like you said, it's cool to, to race against guys like Scott, like Tony, um, guys that have proven that serious champions, Indy 500 winners, um, you know, all around legends of the sport um, and they're still driving. So it's, it's really cool to be able to drive against them. Well, that was Colton Hurtis saying Indy 500 winning teammate Ryan Hunter Ray, Indy 500 winning teammate Alexander Rossi, nothing to offer of value. Elio yeah. Castro Neves. Now that's where the real value comes in. Sorry, a little shade there for no reason, but you know me. I'm, I'm a bit messy. Let's close on this, Colton. So we're going to go race. We're going to do 500 miles. It's probably going to be insane. Forecast is looking like it's not going to be super baking hot. Maybe the track temperatures won't be insane. I know that during some of the pre-qualifying, you know, race prep, track temperatures got up. There was some real, oh my gosh, moments holding on to the car. Sunday was a little bit better that way, that final session. Any thoughts on what fans might see when we get to Sunday and we have to go race in those conditions? You think passing might happen? You throwing down on Dixon in turn one, lap one? What, what are we looking for? um yeah i think i think the top three guys can pass if they choose to do so um you know i think the only reason you won't see passing is because guys don't want to pass early on um they want to sit sit in the draft and basically wait um save fuel you don't want to get behind early so they, they probably want to save fuel as much as they can um and 
so yeah, it, it, it might be a case of the top three guys switching around a little bit in the beginning, uh, taking turns leading, um, giving everybody a chance to, to do what they want. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not too sure on what I want to do yet. Um, you know, I want, I've, apparently I've led a lap at Indy, but I didn't know I've led a lap in Indy. So I would, I would like to truly lead a lap while every, I think when I led a lap is kind of in between pit cycles hmm. and I don't really count that. So I'd like to lead a true lap at Indy. Um, so yes, I mean, if I, if I have the opportunity on lap one going into turn one or turn three with, uh, Dixon, I, I probably would pass him just, just to say I could lead a lap at Indy, uh, truly. So we will, uh, yeah, lot to think about, lot to go over. Going over it today with my engineer. Obviously, we have a few more days to go over everything, but um, making sure we're in in the right place um, and, and watching previous years Indy 500s for sure, um, just to make sure that I understand how this race is going to run, especially at the front. I know what type of fuel numbers I need to hit, and I know you know how to not get behind on those fuel numbers because uh, once you kind of get behind early on on fuel, it's kind of hard to hard to bring it back especially mm. if you're if you're at the front um so yeah a lot to think about a lot to think about and a lot to learn still um so i'll be going over all that you know i actually realized i failed to ask you possibly the most important question of all yes you did bait well i got one more for you too but bait uh big mouth bass fishing at indianapolis what's the hot <laughs> bait um so i use this uh, i don't even know what it's called it's like a sinker bait but it's like a it's a little jig that's like kind of sits um, a little bit off the bottom, and uh, even though it's pretty hot at Indy, the bass aren't really up there yet, so you can't use like a top water or anything like that because they they're not really up there. Um, but yeah, you yeah you use like these worms or, or these little little fish that are kind of like little jigs mid level um, jigs that sink and uh, yeah. You, the real fisherman will probably be able to tell that I'm not, not a true fisherman, uh, but I enjoy it. So I'm learning. And if that gives people any insight, if they ever want to fish the pond, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't my idea, but there are fish in there. So there you go. Front row at the Indy 500, Matt, we're really trying to work on the hot setup for bass fishing. There at the you go. Motor Speedway. We're All right, let's in. close with the, uh, the the real last question here. And I pose this to a number of drivers. I won't tell you their answers, but Connor Daly opened up a can of worm a couple months ago on social media saying he had a dream of bringing a bison, as American as could be, onto the Indy driver's intro stage this Sunday morning. I've been asking every driver that I speak with what they would bring, what kind of animal, land, air, sea, you name it. What does a kid from Southern California say for his answer? Um, past or present? Any. Uh, I would fly in on a pterodactyl for sure. I would be on top of the pagoda, per and I'd be on the pterodactyl just perched, and we'd swoop down right onto the stage as the other. So I'm obviously starting on the front row. So I'll be in the middle, um, and driver intros, the two people will walk up, and I'll swoop down on a pterodactyl, and it won't even stop flying. I'll just jump off of it, and then it'll go straight up and just perched on probably like one of the 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 probably the 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 stands, right in front of the right in front of the uh, start finish line. So straight from the pagoda, swoop down, jump off, land on my land on my spot, and then the pterodactyl just takes off. Do you train your pterodactyl to like grab? Dixie and VK and and I mean the front row is all yours. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean yeah, I'm sure that thing's got talons that could probably mess up some people, but um, no, I think it's it's more just for I don't know commercial use. I don't. Know. <laughs> you scared the head. Well, Colton Hurt is Jurassic Park coming to Valencia, California. I'd like there to go. see that. There you go. Pterodactyl never change. Colton Herta never yeah. change. <laughs> Good luck this weekend. Going to be uh, obviously watching you with great interest, and hopefully you can add some more to this pretty amazing career that you've already written for yourself. Thank you. Thank you.